believe the immune system generally distinguishes from foreign from self, uh, although dysfunctions of low immunity and inflammatory conditions do cause harm to the cell. Now, there are two primary arms of the immune system. First is innate immunity, uh, which acts as the first line of defense against pathogens providing broad antigen non-specific responses to a range of pathogenic markers. Now this is comprised of many cell types which have different functions such as being mast cells and basophils and eosinophils are involved in things such as allergic reactions and parasitic infections. Um, monocytes and neutrophils and macrophages are the professional phagocytes that engulf and destroy pathogens. Then you have dendritic cells collect and present pathogen markers to the adaptive arm, which is the next I'll talk about. So importantly, it does not have immunological memory or the ability to recognize and target very specific markers from specific pathogens. Now, the adaptive arm provides subsequent defenses from innate responses and develops responses against specific pathogens, which is the hallmark of immunological memory. Importantly, this comprises of B cells, which produce antibodies that bind and mark specific pathogens for destruction, like I said before, and T cells, which attack such pathogens to enhance killing. Now, the basis of traditional immunological memory lies with the T and B cell receptors, where T and B cells rearrange and recombine their receptor genes to produce various receptors capable of binding specific pathogens. And with B cells, they also undergo somatic hypermutation of the B cell receptor, which helps to develop different antibodies. And importantly, binding of these receptors with their cognate antigens, because those are the ones that they specifically are able to recognize, uh, leads to expansion of their populations and directed attacks against the insult. Meanwhile, innate immune activity lies uh, the, the basis of this activity lies with what are called pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs. Uh, these bind different classes of pathogen markers, non-specifically, to induce broad, generalized responses, such as inflammatory cytokine production and phagocytosis, which is the engulfment and destruction of pathogens. So two well-known classes of these PRRs are C-type lectin receptors, which recognize carbohydrate uh, um, markers on cell walls like fungi and bacteria, and the toll-like receptors, which recognize a lot of different bacterial components, viral components, etc. These use, utilize complex signaling mechanisms, as you can see, uh, to induce these responses. So for my primary project, these two types were very However, I want to begin by briefly discussing this project that was close to my heart. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, early reports indicated many of the lungs of deceased patients were filled with this thick gelatinous mucus with severe clotting in the lungs and in the blood, with just decreased adaptive immune cells or lymphocytes, while neutrophil numbers were greatly increased, especially in the this was strikingly similar to what is found in severe cystic fibrosis patients. Thick lung mucus, uh, lung and heart blood clots all over, high neutrophil counts in the lungs, including the presence of what are known as neutrophil extracellular traps, which I will discuss momentarily. So the primary treatment for these patients is what's called a, a recombinant human DNase-1 enzyme, uh, also known as Dornase alpha which is nebulized and inhaled into the lungs to break apart these obstructive enzymes. So neutrophil extracellular traps, or NETs, they're pretty much a web of good and bad things. So they're net or web-like extracellular structures, which are comprised of decondensed nuclear DNA coated with antimicrobial enzymes from neutrophils, such as myeloperoxidase, or MPO, and neutrophil elastics. These processes can be initiated by reactive oxygen species acting on 
granules containing these enzymes and to have PAD4, which changes histone um, markers on the DNA or as the DNA, causing decondensation and nuclear collapse. So the DNA is expelled from the cell, and as it's going out, the positively charged granule proteins associated with the negatively charged DNA. Now, nets are meant to trap and kill microbes, but they also lead to extensive, even damaging inflammation. And they can be identified by measuring things like uh, enzymes bound to the DNA, such as myeloperoxidase, DNA complexes, and body, something like it, enzyme linked immunosorbent assays, which helps us measure that concentration. In the COVID 19 lungs, extensive inflammation and lack of nets leads to dramatic mucus buildup, like I discussed, and lung injury with decreased gas exchange. And as Anna mentioned, working with Dr. Zach Holliday in critical care medicine here at Mizzou, we propose that treatment of severe COVID-19 patients with Dornix Alpha would break apart the nets, lead to, as shown here, decreased mucus buildup, decreased lung injury, and increased gas exchange, leading to better clinical outcomes for these patients. So, as Adam said, we performed this small clinical trial in COVID-19 patients that required mechanical ventilation. So there were 10 patients total receiving Dornix Alpha plus standard of care, dexamethasone and remdesivir, and 20 control patient, patients just receiving the standard of care. <clears throat> so what we did was to collect blood and lung fluid on day zero before and day four after treatment with Dornix Alpha. From the blood, we isolated neutrophils and induced production of nets to see how if the neutrophils were primed. Then we isolated serum from the blood and saved this alongside lung fluid, which is also called bronchoalveolar lavage fluid or BALF. <laughs> then we performed um, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays to quantify the nets in all these fluids we got, comparing before and after treatment. So using this ELISA, we found that there were significantly decreased markers of nets in the bout or lung fluid of the patients after treatment, suggesting these structures were broken up by the medication. And although not statistically significant, I'd like to point out that there was a decrease in induced nets isolated or from neutrophils isolated from the blood, which might indicate that they have been less primed to respond. So, and though not discussed here, um, the treated patients had better clinical scores, such as an increased ability of the lungs to expand without breathing and lower requirement of oxygen for um, during treatment. 